We come to the sacred space made more sacred in this moment by the presence and attention of each and every one of us. Friends in the pews, let us take a moment and wave at the camera near the welcoming congregation banner to send our greetings to those at home. And now, as, we, as is our practice, let's take a moment to greet one another in the pews. Welcome everyone to this morning's service of the Winchester Unitarian Society, a caring religious community devoted to spiritual growth, social transformation, and environmental responsibility. For those who don't know me, I'm Martin Newhouse, and I am serving as worship associate this morning. As a welcoming congregation, we affirm the full inclusion of people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. As Unitarian Universalists, our faith does not require us to believe in a dogma, a tenet, or a creed, and among us we believe many different things. We prize freedom of thought and open, honest discussion and questioning, because these we believe enrich both our spiritual lives and our work in the community. Indeed, we can still today, as I say every Sunday that I'm up here, we can still today proudly state, as the very first minister of this society, Richard Metcalf, said over 100 years ago, we do not regard even the best creed as final. We look for new truths and new statements of old ones. We maintain the unlimited right of free inquiry. But while our faith does not impose any dogma or belief, we recognize that it does call upon us to do certain things. And among these, we recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And in that spirit, we greet with joy and fellowship all who are with us in the pews this morning and those who are with us via live streaming, and we welcome you all. And we are especially happy, of course, to welcome you to our next to last 2024 summer service. These are services led by members and staff of our congregation, and today's service will be led by Brett Mulder, whose theme this morning, as you know from the order of service, is mystical experience, healing, and spirituality. And after today's service, at around 11.20 or 11.30, there'll be a discussion with Brett about this morning's service and reflection. This will take place in the parlor, and all are welcome to join us there. And, we'll, and we will announce uh, that folks should gather for discussion by ringing that terrible bell in the Sims room. <laughs> Our opening words this morning come from the philosopher and theologian Paul Tillich. And he wrote as follows. If we enter the levels of personal existence which have been rediscovered by psychology, we encounter the past, the ancestors, the collective unconscious, the living substance in which all living beings participate. In our search for the, quote, really real, unquote, we are driven from one level to another to a point where we cannot speak of level anymore, where we must ask for that which is the ground of all levels, giving them their structure and their power of being. Now it's time for the chalice lighting. We light our chalice this morning with these words. Mystical experience can involve a profound sense of connection with a higher power, 
And this connection is often described as radiant light. The light may manifest in various ways, as a physical glow, a spiritual radiance, or a symbolic representation of divine wisdom. It can be experienced as a sudden epiphany, a gradual awakening, or a continuous presence in one's life. This light is not merely a passive experience. It calls us to action. It inspires us to live more authentically, to serve others with compassion, and to seek a deeper understanding of the mysteries of life. And now please rise in body or in spirit to join us in singing our opening hymn, number 83, Winds Be Still. Good morning, everyone. So for the meditation this morning, what I'd invite you to do is to close your eyes. And before I start getting into the meditation, I want you to close your eyes and bring attention to your body. We hold a lot of attention in our body. So I'd like you to first focus on your jaw, a place where we often hold tension, and just kind of gently open your jaw, open your mouth. And then bring attention to your shoulders and focus on relaxing your shoulders. And then bring attention all the way down to your hands. We often clench our hands. Just open your hands gently. Leave them open. And then bring attention to your hips, a place where we often have tension. Just focus on relaxing your hips. And let your tension go all the way down, your legs to your knees, to the bottom of your feet and just open up your feet, relax them, and open them up. And with your eyes still closed, I want you to just feel into these words that I'm gonna to read to you from a meditation from Jack Kornfield. So the meditation is, we all need healing at different times in our lives. Sometimes we need healing for physical illness. At other times, we need to heal the traumas that we've suffered and find ways to release the difficulties of the past that we carry in our bodies. We need release from the struggles and emotions brought about by our conflicts. 
and the pain that we experience from the follies of humanity. To heal, we cannot reject our illness and grief or use anger and aversion to try to get rid of them. Instead, we have to bring a tender, healing energy to all that is sick or torn, what is broken or lost. Sometimes this is all that healing asks, that we become present. You should never underestimate your power to heal when you step toward difficulty with courage and love, when you touch pain with healing rather than fear. Our healing comes with our own kind attention and through the kind embrace of another. As long as you can, find a passion for the preciousness of life and bring this care to the healing of your heart and body. continue in the centering part of today's service and we also continue our summer service tradition of lighting candles of joy and concern. And we begin this by sharing our joys and sorrows and concerns and by doing so we acknowledge the mutual support of this wonderful community. Then we will be together during a moment of shared silence and we will emerge from that by singing hymn number 89 in the gray hymnal, Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. As we begin, I want to remind everyone, as we always do, that uh, the service is being recorded, and so it'll be available to the public on our website, so be mindful of that uh, when you come up to speak, that anyone in the world can hear what you had to say. So please only share those words that you wouldn't mind others hearing, uh, whoever they may be. And now I'll ask people to come forward if you have a joy or a sorrow or a concern that you would like to share with us this morning. I'm Sheila Rudolph Correa, and my joy is that my daughter Star has an apartment and will be moving into her new digs over by Northeastern on September 1st, which is the same day that Ivan and I are going to Portugal, so it's going to be a bit of a rush for us to get from there to the airport, but uh, she's got a place to live. We're so excited. And I have a joy that I'd like to share, which is that on that same day, September 1st, when Sheila and Ivan are going to Portugal, <laughs> Ivan is gonna be our worship associate for the service that I lead. So I have a great joy that Ivan has agreed to do that on the cusp of leaving on this wonderful trip. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be no last minute change. Would anybody else like to come up and share a joy or a sorrow or a concern? If there's no one else who wants to come up, I'm going to ask Liz to light a candle for all those joys and sorrows and concerns that we have in our thoughts and on our hearts that are unspoken today, both for those here and for also for those who are watching us via streaming.
As noted in the order of service, the reading is by Thich Nhat Hanh. When you wake up and you see that the earth is not just the environment, the earth is us. You touch the nature of interbeing. And at the, that moment, you can have real communication with the earth. That is the highest form of prayer. In that kind of relationship, you will have the love, strength, and awakening you need to change your life. The truth is that many of us have become alienated from the earth. We forget that we are alive here on a beautiful planet and that our body is a wonder given to us by the earth and the whole cosmos. If the earth has been able to offer life, it is because she too has non-earth elements in her, including the sun and the stars. Humankind is made of stars. The earth is not only the earth, but the whole cosmos. Only when you have this right view, this insight, will discrimination no longer be there, and there will be deep communion, deep communication between you and the earth. All kinds of good things will come from it. You transcend the dualistic way of seeing things, the idea that the earth is only the environment and that you are in the center, and that you only want to do something for the earth so you can survive. So I am very excited to be talking with you about mystical experience today. And I said to Liz before I started, uh, the service started today, I, I sort of talk about mystical experience a lot with my wife. We're sort of talk, taking walks throughout the neighborhood. And I think she's, my wonderful wife, Luna, I think she's so tired of hearing me talk about mystical experience. <laughs> so now I get to talk about it with all of you. Uh, so excited to be part of the conversation today. As if some of you stay later, we'll have an opportunity to kind of talk about the service and anything it might provoke for you, any of your personal experiences, any thoughts, feelings that you have about it. So today I'm gonna to be exploring this wonderful mystery of mystical type experiences and their relationship with healing and spiritual development. And I'm gonna start this reflection today with a quote from an academic article. But please, I wanna ask you, don't, do not fall asleep yet. All right, so here's the quote. It comes to us from the academic journal, JAMA Psychiatry, and this journal is regarded as among the top five journals in medicine and science. And it also comes from a study that was conducted by investigators at Johns Hopkins Medical School, where they were evaluating a randomized control trial of psilocybin-assisted therapy on major depression. So here's the quote. In several studies of patients and in healthy volunteers, the intensity of mystical type experiences reported after psilocybin sessions was associated with favorable outcomes, end quote. So this article then goes on to show that study participants who received psilocybin-assisted therapy experienced rapid and enduring antidepressant effects for at least four weeks. So there was another study led by the psychologist Roland Griffiths, who's also at Johns Hopkins Medical School, and it was a study that occasioned mystical type experiences with psilocybin and psychological support. And what they found in this study was that approximately a third of the subjects who had these experiences, they evaluated these experiences as being the single most spiritually significant experience of their lives. I wanna read that again. As being the single most spiritually significant experience of their lives. And 71% of those in the study who had these experiences rated it among the top five experiences, spiritual experiences of their lives. Comparing it to childbirth, the death of a loved one or a parent. So the, the researchers who conducted the study were honestly astounded by these results. What was going on in these experiences? So this is what I wanna explore with you today. What is involved in this curious relationship between mystical type experiences, healing, and spirituality? So mystical type experiences have been 
the focus of religious scholars and communities for hundreds of years. But now we're seeing this fascinating intersection with the fields of mental health involving psychiatry and psychology and neuroscience. And as we collectively know, our country has been experiencing an ongoing mental health epidemic. It's been exacerbated by the destabilizing effects of the pandemic and its disproportional impact to black and brown communities and especially teenagers. So might a window into mystical type experiences provide a ray of light into what can foster our spiritual development and how it can help us to heal from suffering caused by mental health conditions. So in exploring this question, I wanna invite you to follow me down the rabbit hole. So I wanna start by describing what is a mystical type experience? So the psychologist Bill Richards in his book, Sacred Knowledge, Psychedelics and Religious Experiences, identifies six components of a mystical experience. The first is the sense of unity, a sense of interconnectedness. The second is the sense of a transcendence during the experience of time and space, the usual markers, time and space. It is also these experiences that provide a kind of intuitive knowledge, different from rational knowledge, intuitive knowledge. Also a sense of sacredness, a deeply felt positive mood that, ex that individuals experience, and lastly, the sense of ineffability. Ineffability meaning that the words that we have just don't accurately represent the, the complexity and the wonder of these experiences. So Richards, in his book, makes the essential point that these kinds of experiences, these mystical experiences, they've been experienced by individuals in deep states of meditation associated with different religious traditions. They've been experienced by individuals who go through periods of fasting and sensory deprivation. Also individuals who go through experiences of childbirth or those having near-death experiences. And lastly, that a variety of indigenous cultures and ancient uh, Ancient cultures have used plant-based sacraments and substances for healing and revelation for over thousands of years. So at the core of these mystical type experiences that we're exploring today are psychological states of self-transcendence. So I wanna spend a little time unpacking what that means. So throughout our everyday normal waking consciousness, we're constantly thinking, right? We're narrating about what's going on. Sometimes we're worrying about what's coming up in the future. Sometimes we're ruminating and reflecting on something that happened in the past. And at times we might be talking to ourselves about what's happening in the news. I know I do this a lot. And there is a self throughout these experiences, a self that is the philosopher Dan Dennett once called it, that a self that is the center of narrative gravity. So it's a self that tells stories where you, me, your bodies are the central character Right? These stories, they, they help to make meaning of our childhood, our teenage years, our movement through, ad, through adulthood. They're stories that help to organize our aspirations, our values, our ways of being. And each of us also goes through what the Buddhist psychiatrist Mark Epstein calls the trauma of everyday life. The trauma of everyday life, what it does, it leaves imprints on the self. It impacts how we see who we are and at times it can incline us to have experiences of feeling unseen, unwanted, ignored, or not valued. And unfortunately, children, teens, and adults can also experience physical and emotional and sexual trauma and or neglect at different points in their development. And this can also leave devastating imprints on the psyche. So that if individuals who go through this experience, you can internalize thoughts like, I am inadequate, I am worthless, I am unwanted, I am unlovable. Now what is stunning about mystical experiences that have as a central feature states of self-transcendence is that the I, the self, the ego that is at the center of this narrative gravity, what happens in these experiences is that it goes offline for a time. So neuroscientists have identified that part of the brain that's involved in self-representation, what's called the default mode network, what actually happens by looking at brain scans in these experiences is that it becomes quieted in these experiences. So when this storytelling center dissolves, or in some cases actually temporarily dies, 
what can emerge are profoundly meaningful and spiritual experiences where a person feels a connectedness to nature, a connectedness to others, or even a connectedness to the entire cosmos. Experiences that have what William James called a noetic quality, meaning that they arrive with a unique kind of authority, not for others, but for oneself, and a sense of sacredness. These experiences, they reveal themselves as more real than everyday waking experience. So I want you to consider a description from a middle-aged woman with a history of kidney cancer reporting after a psilocybin session. Here's what she said. I had a sense of losing my observer. I no longer witnessed the images, I was becoming them. My body lit up all parts in succession. It was the brightest thing I have ever seen. I glowed brilliantly from within. My whole being fluttered. I felt as if I was being breathed through or played like an instrument. Stunningly beautiful. I got that every part of all of us is sacred. The world is a misery out of love, presenting us with constant opportunities to find our way home. I'm seeing myself in everybody and everybody in myself. Additionally, in mystical experiences, Neuroscientists have observed a state of hyperconnectivity and metaplasticity in the brain, allowing different brain regions to communicate more freely and creating increased sensitivity to learn new insights after these experiences. What can happen in mystical experiences is that the rational part of our psyche that relies on logic and reasons as the sole basis for knowledge, it gets loosened. And the mind becomes more open through a process of in, uh, involving a global desegregation of different brain regions. And in these experiences, individuals report gaining increased access to emotional and intuitive knowledge and experience deep and personal spiritual insights about oneself, about others, and the divine. So I want to consider another passage from the scholar of world religions, Houston Smith, from his book, Cleansing the Doors of Perception, about a mystical experience that he had. Here's what he wrote. The experience was powerful for me. It left a permanent mark on my experience worldview. For as long as I can remember, I've believed in God and I've experienced his presence both within the world and when the world was transcendentally eclipsed. But until the experience, I had had no direct personal encounter with the God of the sort of the Bhakti Yogas, the Pentecostals, the born again Christians. The Gestalt transformed itself from a routine musical progression into the most powerful cosmic homecoming I have ever experienced. And I'd like to add another passage from the mystical experience of a man with lung cancer whose religious orientation was Tibetan Buddhist. Here's what he said. Though I do not believe in a creator God outside of which is self-existent or existent independent of our own thoughts, our own cognition, I felt this session brought me to the God experience, whatever that means. I do not feel that I became one with God or I reached out and touched God. Rather, I had the deep feeling of becoming God for it was actually a short time, but seemed like a millennia. So these experiences, they unfold quite mysteriously in this mental landscape where our normal markers of space and time, they fall away. And this quality adds to their sense of sacredness. These mystical experiences can feel so different from normal waking consciousness, often possessing the sense of ineffability that I talked about earlier, where words feel utterly impoverished and inaccurate tools for representing these lived experiences of unity, interconnectedness, beauty, and love. So I want to consider another passage from Houston Smith, who I referenced earlier. D. 
detailing additional aspects of a mystical experience that he had, emphasizing this sense of ineffability that I talked about a moment ago. Here's what he wrote. As in Plato's myth of the cave, what I was now seeing struck me with the force of the sun in comparison with which everyday experience reveals only flickering shadows in a dim cavern. How could these layers upon layers, these worlds within worlds, these paradoxes, which I could be both myself and my world, and an episode both momentary and eternal, how could such things possibly be put into words? And finally, I'd like to share with you another moving passage that comes from a 31-year-old cancer patient married with two children and suffering from advanced stage, stage four lymphoma, who received a psychedelic medicine as part of a clinical trial. Here's what she said. I first went to this place that seemed to completely lack the qualities of the world as we know it. I seemed to transcend time and space and I completely lost identification with the, quote, real world. The basic theme that I perceived was that life continues to go on and that we're basically some form of essence from a supreme being, and we are part of that supreme being. I don't have a fear of death that I once had. I found that everyday living seems to be much more enjoyable small things in life that I may have overlooked, I seem to appreciate now. I have a much greater understanding of other people and a much greater capacity to try to fulfill other people's needs. Overall, I think I'm a much more content individual, having had the opportunity to just glimpse for a short moment the overall thinking of God to be reassured that there is a very beautiful, loving, masterful plan in the universe for all of us. So in closing, I'd like to reflect on why I think it's important for our culture to care about and to be interested in mystical experiences. So first, we frankly, we need better treatments to help people, to help support people suffering from the destabilizing and disabling impact of trauma, major depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and substance dependence. Each one of us in the audience today very likely has some personal connection, either in your own story or in somebody that you know very intimately with a mental health condition. So for example, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. So according to the United Nations World Health Organization, the WHO, depression affects more than 300 million people worldwide and is the fourth leading cause of the global disease burden. The WHO also estimates that depression is responsible for 20% of lost healthy days globally and that only 10% of people who need treatment for mental health issues receive it. So therapeutic experiences that can reliably occasion mystical experiences and are safe, efficacious, and tolerated by a wide range of people, they present us with these unique and innovative treatment opportunities that are worth exploring. And second, Unitarian Universalism is the spiritual community that's uniquely poised to welcome in the insights and personal growth occasioned by these mystical type experiences. Unitarians hold that even the best creeds are not regarded as final and reserves the right of unlimited inquiry. As William James described in his work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, mystical experiences are a crucial aspect of our psychi psychology and our spirituality. Mystical experiences can facilitate and deepen our spiritual development. And in turn, these kind of experiences can serve to deepen engagement with our spiritual community here at the Winchester Unitarian Society. And they can enliven the work that we do in concert with one another. 
And lastly, a major societal problem that this congregation has addressed before and continues to address in services and committee work is the problem of global warming and climate change. The peace activist and Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, so we heard about in the reading today, he teaches about this concept of interbeing, which means that everything is interconnected. This includes humans, animals, plants, and the environment. We aren't separate entities, but rather we're part of this vast, intricate web of life. Further, he emphasizes that the earth itself is a living being capable of feeling pain and joy. And this deeply spiritual understanding of our essential relationship and connection to nature is potentially uh, catalyzed by these mystical type experiences. As we've seen in the testimony of others that I read to you, we can not only rationally learn, but we can deeply feel our interconnectedness with other beings and the environment through these experiences. And this has the potential to motivate, to sustain, and to deepen our community and our collective actions that address climate change. So there is a kind of poison that our minds are exposed to. Messages that tell us stories about how refugees are criminals, why we should fear and distrust our neighbor that incline us to feel contempt for the other instead of loving kindness. We need a revival of these kinds of experiences that nurture our connection to one another and to nature, that help us to heal from the suffering of being human, and that allow us to see ourselves in a blade of grass, in a sunset, or even in the gaze of a blue jay. Thank you very much, Brett, for that very moving reflection. We now come to the offering. Our weekly offering is an opportunity of dedication and invitation to live our values through acts of generosity. In this way, the offering is a spiritual practice, a collective affirmation of our shared values and commitment to the mission of this liberal religious congregation. Those attending via live stream will soon see information about how to donate. Those in the sanctuary are also welcome to donate electronically, and you may find more information in your order of service. And finally, if you are visiting us for the first time, we invite you to be our guest. The most valuable thing you can offer is your completed visitor information card so we can stay connected beyond this Sunday. The cards are found in the pew pack and right in front of you in the sanctuary and there'll be a visitor card displayed or a form displayed for those streaming, attending through streaming. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
Those who wish to do so are invited to join me in the unison affirmation, which is in your order of service. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. We create and reaffirm this covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. Now please rise in body or in spirit to join in singing our closing hymn, number 92 in the gray hymnal, Mysterious Presence, Source of All. In closing, I want to give a special thanks to Martin and Liz who helped organize the service. And I also just want to express how lucky we are to get to hear the music of John Kramer every Sunday. My goodness. Thank you, John. I love it. So in closing today, i uh, read to you a line from Jack Kornfeld. But even after achieving such realization, after the ecstasy, we are faced with the day-to-day -day task of translating that freedom into our imperfect lives. We are faced with the laundry.
Let us read together the words for extinguishing the chalice that are in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This service is ended, but our life of service continues. Let us now gather in the Sims room for friendship and refreshment, and then all are invited to join our after-service discussion in the parlor. <laughs>